After completing Transformers, we went on to quickly look at basic fluorescent lighting circuits. Uh, very little knowledge here to move forward to our exam and certainly no calculations. It's just remembering the basic instruction and really what the inductor is doing. The inductor can also be called a choke or a ballast within questions in this section. When the fluorescent line circuit is completed by closing the switch at the door, the circuit is made through the ballast itself. Remember, it can be called a choke or inductor. Circuit then goes through to the starter. The starter blades are in the open position. The heat is generated in the neon gas in the starter, causing the blades within there to close. Circuit is completed round to the other side of the tube. What happens then is the gas starts to cool. Um, it opens the blades within the starter causing the massive back EMF developed by the choke to be dropped across the very low resistive tube, causing the tube to ignite or light. The questions in the exam are more based on what the ballast is doing in circuit. So on starting up, the ballast is there to develop the large back EMF that drops across the low resistance tube. When the lamp is illuminated, the job of the ballast then is to be a current limiting resistor in circuit. And the questions in this section will be about the capacitors. There's two capacitors normally in a fluorescent lighting circuit. There is one in parallel with the supply, which is there for power factor correction, which we went on to look at in a small set of notes at the very end on AC theory. Another capacitor is built within the actual starter to limit radio suppressive interference, that crackling effect when the fluorescent lighting circuit is turned on that causes interference in radios, etc. So after fluorescent light fittings, we went on to look at AC theory. I'm going to pare this down quite a lot in this presentation. We took ourselves to a painful position in the classroom notes. Our exam at level one and level two doesn't require anything near what those notes took us to. Those notes were introducing really AC theory for level three. So this is the minimum requirement of recall knowledge within this section on AC theory. We said in an AC circuit that is purely resistive, the current and voltage are in phase. We said in an AC circuit that is purely inductive, the current will lag the voltage by 90 degrees. And finally, in a purely capacitive AC circuit, we said the current will lead the voltage by 90 degrees. These three are regularly asked in multi-choice questions, especially at level two, and need remembering. Resistive in phase, inductive lags by 90 degrees, capacitive leads by 90 degrees. We went on to look at the impedance triangle, and we said that AC, current being passed through a circuit, now offers impedance made up of the resistance and the inductive reactance elements of the circuit. So we went on to use the impedance triangle, so three sides of a triangle, and we did the A squared, B squared, and C squared, so we looked at a little bit of trigonometry in order to start working out the impedance of a circuit. Again, I'm not looking for us to remember necessarily the maths part of it here, I need us to remember that the opposition to current flow in a circuit with AC in it is impedance, represented by the letter Z, and impedance is also measured in ohms as is resistance, as being the opposition to current flow. After working with trigonometry to find any one of the three missing sides of the calculation set out in my notes, again not necessarily required for this presentation, we went on to look at power factor correction. Again, we need to remember that a power factor will be between a number between 0 and 1. If the power factor was 1, we said that the power factor is in unity. In other words, true power and apparent power are the same. We don't like to leave circuits at unity, at 1. We like to have a slightly lagging power factor, so our number will be less than 1 between that and 0. So often we hear power factors of 0.85 or 0.9 lagging as a power factor. We went on to work out simple calculations for power factor as well. We worked out our power factor in three ways. We did true power over apparent power. We did kilowatts or watts over KVA or VA. And we did resistance over impedance. Again, it would be lovely to remember all three, but worst case position or worst case scenario is to remember power factor will be a number between one and zero. Unity is at one. We like to leave our lagging power factor of say 0 0.8, 0 0.9, etc. After the misery of AC theory, which I made last about two and a half minutes in this presentation, and last just one whole three hour evening, we went on to look at three phase systems. Three phase generation of supply has our three lines being generated 120 degrees apart which mathematically is 1.732 and was used in the section on star and delta connected loads. Again, if we can remember 120 degrees apart, it's another question we can get right in this section on three phase systems. 
We looked at delta connected loads not having a neutral, which is simply comprised of three lines. We looked at a star connected load where a neutral was introduced. The reason the neutral was introduced is so we could have a single phase supply off any one line and neutral, giving us a single phase supply. Where delta didn't, because delta only had three lines and you couldn't generate a single phase supply from it. We then went on to look at the section on star and delta connected loads and do the mathematical relationships between line and phase currents and voltages. Again, a trickier section that requires calculations, but some bits can be remembered without the use of a calculator. In a delta connected load, the line and phase voltages are equal. In a delta connected load, the currents are out by 1.732. If you knew the line current between any two lines, the current, the phase current would be the line current divided by 1.732. If you had the phase current and you wanted to find the line current, you'd multiply the phase current by 1.732. In a star connected load, we've introduced a neutral, so this time the line voltages and phase voltages are out by 1.732, but in a star connected load, what is common, the line current and phase current are both the same. If you knew the line voltage in a star connected load and you divided it by 1.732, you would get the phase voltage. If you knew the phase voltage of a star connected load and multiplied it by 1.732, you would get the line voltage. So let's recap. Easy things to remember. Delta connected load has no neutral, therefore the line and phase voltages are equal. The currents are out by 1.732. Star connected load. In a star connected load, a neutral is introduced. Therefore, the voltages are out by 1.732, but the currents in a star connected load are the same in all parts. I recommend you have your set of notes in front of you as you've just looked through this presentation or as you go through it the second time, get your notes out for for the presentation as you run through. It's not as simple as some of the other ones, just remember some of those facts. The notes will help jog your memory.